Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Benny Chan, and today I'm here to talk about our theory of change and practice and how the School of Science at the College of New Jersey has tried to create inclusive excellence. So a little bit about me. Um, my parents came here uh, from Hong Kong and China. They, uh, uh, they, they came here because of the American dream. So my whole family came here on the concept that our education system in the United States was so great that we could actually move up in our social classes by getting more education. And for me, that worked out great. So this American dream idea is how we kind of worked uh, in the United States. And, and it worked out for me. I'm a first generation college student. I got a college degree. I have a PhD in chemistry. And now I'm working at a top college in the United States. But as I worked at the college in New Jersey, I started to question, does this really happen? Um, and we started to look at data and how students were succeeding at the College of New Jersey in the School of Science. So nationally, we can get this data and we can look at how students succeed um, in at TCNJ and nationally. We can look to see how many students actually get natural science degrees that wanted to major in a natural science. For white students, it's only 1.7% of the students that don't get their degrees. If we look at the Asian students, it ticks up a little bit more. However, when we jump up to the Latinx students, we see that we have a large jump to 20%. And then we go to a whopping 40% for the black students across the country. Of course, there's many of us that sit there and say, this is national data. This doesn't happen at my school. And it certainly doesn't happen at in my classes. However, if we look at the data, we can actually see that it does happen. So if we look at the rate at which students get Ds, Fs, or Ws in their first semester classes, we see that we see the same trends for our students of color, for our Latinx and our black students. So this is when I got really, really concerned about the issues that were happening nationally and locally. So it became my vision and the vision of the School of Science to create a thriving, diverse STEM workforce that leverages and mirrors our diverse populations. So our work here started with a lot of programs that focused on student success and helping fix students in terms of adapting to our curriculum and our identity, our, our courses. So once we had to work through this, we started to look at a lot of different activities. And what really made the change for me was when I started to, to work with another colleague. I got coffee with a new faculty member, Dr. Lynn Gaisley. And she uh, talk, uh, talked about her research at Northwestern University. And when we started to talk about it, she was studying how biomedical students um, succeed and fail in their PhD programs, and she focused on minority students. So the story that was most striking to me was when she told me about a black PhD, PhD student at one of the top universities in the country. He would come to work and go to the lab on a regular basis, and he would be stopped to ask, and the people would ask him, could you clean up this spill? Or could you clean up the bathroom? The bathroom's dirty. So the racial stereotypes were so strong that the people in his community at work thought of him just as a janitor. And this student just wanted to get a PhD in the biomedical sciences. So as we were talking, we found out that this applied, uh, uh, we saw the same kind of trends with our TCNJ students. So we started to work together. So Dr. Sadir Nayak from the biology department and I had already been talk, uh, teaching in our summer scholars program, which is a summer bridge program to help marginalized students succeed at TCNJ. We invited Dr. Gaisley and her undergraduate research team to work with us. And what was amazing with the techniques that she brought to the table with her social science techniques were interviews and understanding of why our students do not succeed. So for example, we have plenty of students that need help and they don't seek help. And based on the interviews, we started to find out why the students were doing that. 
So this black male student told us, you don't want to be that one person that always has a problem, especially here because I'm African American. So I just keep my mouth shut. So for this student, they can't, they don't want to get any help because they don't want to be a problem. And they don't want to fall into the stereotypes uh, that persist for our students of color. So that's when we started to dive into the research and we were really helping our students and they were doing really well uh, in our courses. So we started to see a, a, an additional change. Our faculty members that were teaching in the program started to transform. We started to understand how to work with students better and then the faculty members in turn started changing how they were teaching in the fall semester and during the academic year so that all of our students could benefit from uh, the strategies at work. So our major research question now is can we catalyze this cultural shift across the school of science? Can we shift the entire school of science to be more inclusive in their teaching uh, pedagogy? And we did this by doing a lot of observations. We came up with a theory of change based on the patterns that we were seeing. And our theory of change uh, surrounds the, the concept that we want our faculty members to become experimentalist teachers. So we built this upon three different pillars. The first pillar is gaining an empathy and understanding of our students. So just a little bit more about me. I'm a member of the queer community. Um, I like going to pride parades. I have an extended family. My husband and I just adopted a puppy. We have a grandson that lives with us. So my identities are very complex. And how, my, how I navigate my identities helps me to make our different decisions. Now, if I recognize the complexity in myself, I need to recognize the complexity of my students and all of their different identities that they have that I may not share with them. So by being more empathetic with my students, I'm more likely to help our students get over the different barriers that they, they uh, end up having in our classes and in our, um, in our school. So we can't do this in an academic in environment without some quantitative data. And I can show quantitative data after quantitative data about the, um, the, the, the marginalization of our students of color. But what really made the difference in the work that we're doing is the fact that we are collecting qualitative research. Uh, and interviews from our summer scholar students to really understand what's going on with our students. So for example, in one of our, in, this is a very common experience for our students. In high school, you could just get by without studying and blah, blah, blah. It was like, okay, that's not me. That's not me, right? And when I failed this quiz, I was like, oh snap, it was me. So this quote is about a student who never had to study in high school, and they had come to TCNJ and got a reality check on their first quiz. So and, this is a, and they didn't know what to do with that reality check. What's amazing about the uh, qualitative research that we're doing, not only do we understand that this was not the student's fault, they never had to study in high school, but we can also understand how uh, a successful student navigates this. So a successful student will make a connection to studying, like I really got to study if I want to pass the class. And not just passing the class, not just realizing that studying is important, they need to make a change. If I didn't do well on an exam, I might try something different. So these students that are successful are recognizing the grade shock and starting to make changes for the different classes that they're studying. The other thing that we want to do in our second pillar is start to approach our classroom like a science laboratory. So I love chemistry. Um, that is my discipline, and I love working with our undergraduate researchers. So one of our first projects that we worked with was uh, trying to make iron nitride nanoparticles. And we were making small amounts of it. It was working great at the beginning. And then all of a sudden, our furnace kept exploding every single time we tried to do the reaction. And we didn't understand why. It wasn't until I started to look at the mechanism 
and realized that our reaction was exothermic and we were actually going above the decomposition temperature on a local level that caused our powder to explode. So that was really disappointing. But what if we apply that same concept, that cause and effect to our teaching? And we try to think about the different mechanisms that are available uh, to us on how and why things work. And then we can start to design an intervention site on how to make changes to change the effects at the end. So going back to our grade shock experience, we can find out that the students don't really, they never really had to reflect on their grades and their study habits. And we want them to develop better coping skills. So we can design interventions that include things like making the activities explicit and developing some of their metacognition skills. We want to make sure that they review and reflect upon their performance on exams. And then we talk about it in groups to make sure nobody feels like that they are the only ones experiencing this. So we started to do this experiment with our General Chemistry 1 classroom. And on the surface, it looks like a flipped classroom. Um, we do videos and we do lots of problem solvings in the class. However, it's much more complicated than that based on the models that I just showed you. We call this class a high structure guided practice classroom. And in this classroom, we want to create an, a practice space. That's one thing we learned in the Summer Scholars Program is that our students need a practice space to learn and fail with a strong support system. So that involves a lot of active learning with lots of feedback that builds on fundamental skills like studying, metacognition, and resilience. For our students of color and our queer students, we have to make sure we are culturally responsive, that we understand their needs uh, in the classroom. And then finally, we make sure that the practice is aligned with the activities that we, that we measure their, their learning, like quizzes and exams. So as we test out these pedagogies, we want to go ahead and share our results uh, with our colleagues on a regular basis. And we do this through formal and informal tech, uh, strategies from brown bag lunches uh, to talks in the hallway uh, to formal school science meetings and formal department meetings. So as we were doing this test on general chemistry, we started to share the data with our chemistry department colleagues. So in the fall of 2019, we, we did a class, uh, a bunch of classes, trying out this new high structure guided practice. And this is what we happened if the students were in a traditional classroom. So for all the black uh, and Latinx students, you can see in all three categories, they are underperforming. And in particular, the Pell eligible, which are the lowest income students, they're really underperforming by four times as likely to get a D, F, or W. And what's amazing about the classroom, based on the structures and interventions we designed, we pretty much eliminated those differences and helped almost all the students perform better in our classrooms. So we were able to actually erase race differences. And this is the only kind of racial erasure that I am OK with. I can no longer predict whether a student is going to succeed or fail in my class based on the color of their skin. Not only do we need to get quantitative data, we need to get qualitative data to shift. And there's a concept that students don't like these active learning classrooms. However, we get quotes from students that say things like, before taking Chem 201, I preferred a lecture heavy class, but I don't anymore. That was really important to shift some of the faculty mindsets on this type of class. And not only that, we were sawing some deep learning done by our students. I am grateful for the experience because it helped me to understand that success is in my hands and that I have to drive my own learning process forward. Isn't that the kind of students we want in our class? Isn't that the kind of students that thrive in our STEM disciplines? So by making these structural changes to the classrooms, we were able to see a lot of success. And what's even more amazing, we saw the department shift. The department was excited about the experiments that we were doing. They were starting to understand the empathy that we were trying to instill in our instructors. And we started to share our experiences more and more. And we decided to have all of our Gen Chem class go through this high structure guided practice model. 
and that was going great. At the beginning of the year, we were doing awesome stuff, um, working together in groups. I was working closely with adjuncts, and then all of a sudden, it hit March of 2020, and we all know what happened then. My classroom went from something that was super active to me teaching in my office or at home, and I ended up from staring at a group of people, um, I stared at a bunch of blank Zoom screens. But what was amazing about this kind of work is that we had already done the work of thinking about our vision for our classes. And we saw that the entire department adapted to the emergency shift to remote learning very quickly. We started asking how our students were doing. We started trying new pedagogies in this remote environment. And we were still talking to each other um, through Google Chat and through other uh, electronic techniques. So we were able to make this shift and still work through this. So at the end of the day, we want to think about our shared vision and that we all want to create this thriving, diverse STEM workforce. And I think our model for shifting our faculty culture was really strong in terms of our experiments that we're doing. So we feel that we can create inclusive excellence by changing the system and changing the structure of how we teach our classes. And I think that our models for faculty culture shift is very transferable to other institutions and other departments. I want to thank all of my colleagues that, uh, that have worked on, on this project. There, this, it takes a large number of people uh, to do this kind of work. And I want to thank all of you for listening. Thank you very much.